Good morning, everyone. And welcome to Force Plain Church of the Nazarene. My name is Rebecca, and I'm the youth pastor here. Just a minute. Just a minute. There's something else that's pretty exciting. She's a district license minister. And John is back on track, and he is also a district uh, license minister. Okay, so I'm up here to give you some announcements today. <laughs> and first of all is that tonight we have Grace Groups, and it's the last one in our book series on Way, Truth, Life, Discipleship as a Journey of Grace. Um, so if you've been doing that, come on out to get the last chapter. If you have not been doing it, you can still join, and you can contact me or um, Pastor John. You want to wave your hand, Pastor John? Thank you. Um, you can contact any of us and get con connected with a group. Um, coming up next week, we have Country Gospel Sing on Friday, February 3rd. It's the first Friday of every month at 6.30 p.m. So come on out for that and worship the Lord with some country gospel music. On February 1st, we have our movie night. Um, it's the first Wednesday of the month, also at 6.30 p.m. And then this week, we have our prayer night. So prayer at night is this week on Wednesday, and choir is also starting on Wednesday. So we'll all be meeting in here in the sanctuary, and then we'll break off when choir wants to do their rehearsals for Easter. And if you want to join choir, you can talk to Rod. Want to wave your hand? I have an announcement from Jean. They had their first card making meeting at her house and they're having another one this Thursday, January 26th for card making and fellowship. They're meeting at Jean's house. So you can talk to her and get an address. And I think it's at, oh yes, it's at 11 a.m. and bring a sack lunch. So you can meet at her house for card making, lunch and fellowship. Okay, if you'll bow your heads with me, I'll pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and this opportunity to worship you, to gather together in your name. Thank you for this time that we can learn about you. Um, please bless Pastor Grady as he opens your word and speaks to us today and help us to hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Yes, there are a couple more announcements. So, Susan, you can come on up, and I'll announce the Valentine's dinner as she's coming up. So, if Mom wants to wave her clipboard around again. Thank you. So, Valentine's dinner is February 11th at 5 p.m. That is a Saturday. We'll be meeting here in Franklin Hall, which is downstairs. So, you can sign up and pay in advance by February 1st. Um, everyone is welcome, adults, singles, or couples. It's $12 per person. So, you can see Mom and sign up by February 1st. And then we have an announcement from Susan. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> Good morning. Good um, morning. I am working with Carolyn with for missions, and she's not here today. And we are kind of starting a, a new thing. We have some young folk that are very interested in doing missions. And so we're starting kind of a junior missions group, and they are going to help us out this morning. I am announcing Alabaster Sunday, and you all should have your coins, except I didn't write down what date. Oh. I didn't write it down. The 12th of February. Thank you. I See, I am a baby at this. I need help. Um, I didn't know what Alabaster Sunday meant. And so, as a good student, I looked up um, Alabaster. And it's a compact, fine-textured, usually white and translucent um, gypsum, often carved into vases and ornaments. That's what Webster says. Um, 
alabaster box or jar in the Bible is listed in three places that I found in Matthew, in Mark, and Luke. And they were all talking about the very valuable um, one set of box, but most set of flask, the valuable flask that Mary, that Mary brought the oil and, um, and soothed Jesus, rubbed his feet and stuff. And the way that that translates to us, these are our valuable gifts. And we collect change. If you already have some filled, we have plenty. Is there anyone who wants a box and doesn't have it? Our young folk here, you might want to duck because they may throw them at you. I'm not sure. I think I might have given permission for that. Um, one out in the foyer, too. So hold your hand high so the girls can see you. Or young ladies, excuse me. So these are some of the things that our, our youth are going to be doing. There, there are a million other tasks that we have that they're signing up for, and I'm really proud of them. It is um, Lydia and Lotus and Ruby, and Ruby's not here today. But Ruby is even speaking to me. So I know, right? I just said none of this nonsense, because if you're going to do this, we have to communicate. She's like, OK. So it worked. Um, anybody else? OK, so what does these alabaster offerings go for? I didn't know that either. Um, it goes for the Nazarene church in general, not our church, but overall, um, to purchase land, to build um, hospitals, schools, residents, things like that. So it's all physical properties. It's not missionary work that we traditionally think of, like providing food and, and um, education and things like that. This is on the ground to provide physical buildings and land. Is that right? Everything good? OK. The end. Thank you, girls. There'll be more boxes out um, in the foyer, too. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. My children's lesson today, I just have a couple verses. One of the verses that has been sticking in sticking out to me is Romans 15:13. Now, fair warning, we will get there. We're on 12:1 for a while. But we will get there. Here's a little sneak peek. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes I have to, I have to let people know it's not just about feelings. We ask to be with the Lord. That's, that's what our life is about in Christ. It's not just about feelings. But today, I want to stop emphasizing that because Paul really does say, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. In what? In believing. For no other reason than that you believe in him. You know, we don't just believe in God intellectually. It's not just uh, mentally stimulating. It's that we're truly filled with joy and peace. And I think this is something that we have to get back into the habit of. Um, because Psalm 98, the Psalms are just filled with reminders. Rejoice. Rejoice. Sing to the Lord a new song. David calls him my joy a lot. And I want us to approach God that way today. In Sunday school, we learned that worship, the um, way it's translated now, comes from the English word 
worthyship. And that's the essence of worship, that God is worthy, but more specifically, that he is worthy of our joy. It's like when we come back to the fountain. It's like we come back to the source of everything. Jesus describes the Holy Spirit like a river that will overflow. And so when we come to the Lord today, we're coming back to our river. And there's streams of living water bubbling up and blowing out through us. Psalm 98 says, Break forth in song. You know, when when you worship the Lord, don't just be thinking of other things or casually being just... If we're distracted, if we're looking at other people, we're not worshiping. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way it is. Let us come before him in joy, so that the God of peace may fill us with joy and peace in believing. Thank you. Well, I had a couple people, a few people come up to me this morning and said, we need to sing happy birthday. And so, well, Pastor already said it's Carolyn's birthday. Wave your hand back there. She's also known as a clicker. So when Pastor <laughs> is up here and he goes, click, that's his wife back there in the booth uh, clicking. But anyway, well, let's sing happy birthday. How about the key of G flat? Sound good? I'm just kidding. You pick your own key there. <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday, and you know what? Just for a change, wouldn't it be better to maybe to have the birthday person come and yeah. sing the happy birthday? Yeah. <laughs> Here we go, happy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carolee. Happy birthday. Let's all stand as we join in together in congregational singing. Man. 
You may be seated. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord. Singing, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Let 
sing that one more time. Oh, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something Amen. Amen. I also forgot to tell you that uh, Carolyn lost her mother uh, last night. And uh, they're on their way up to uh, Montana. So uh, we have another one to keep in, in prayer. So what was your favorite toy when you grew up? Can you think of anything? Slinky, those were good. If you could get those to go down those stairs, that was uh, pretty cool. I'll tell you what, uh, one of my uh, favorite, uh, it's right there. But there. You remember that? You still use it. Yeah, Silly Putty is a, was a great game. What a, what a wonderful time to, to take a Sunday morning course. You couldn't use, uh, couldn't look at Sunday morning uh, um, newspaper until Monday, but uh, they had the colored uh, comics in there. It was a great time to uh, take the silly putty, squeeze it down, and pull it off. And this is a, an example of what would happen. Great time. Great time to have a, a, a fun thing that you could squeeze and, and do all kinds of things. Once you had that image on there, you could uh, uh, distort it and, and have uh, great fun doing that. Um, we finally made it to verse 2. Pastor John didn't know that it, we'd ever get there, but, uh, but we're at verse 2 of Romans chapter 12. And this is what it says. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, we are, uh, this might not surprise you, we're going to go real slow on this. And what's uh, underlined there, and do not be conformed, 
It has uh, several different versions uh, that try to explain what that means not to be conformed. Living Bible says this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. The Message Bible said this, don't become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial customs. I like Philip's translation. Don't let the world squeeze you into a mold. I like that. The Greek word uh, conform is from the word schema. Now you've already figured out where we get that word from, right? The idea of scheme, the age of the fad, the style of the day. And one way that you could explain this is uh, by an actor. An actor is one that's handed a script, told don't be who you really are. Uh, this is a character I want you to, dis to live out in front of the camera or on stage, and it's not gonna be your personality, it's going to be what the director has said that it would be. So he hands you a script and you just simply read that script. This captures Paul's meaning on schema is part of the play and someone else wrote it and you're following along with it. Do not be conformed. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Silly putty is a fun thing uh, as a toy, but when it reflects how we live and make decision, in life, that's tragic. First Corinthians chapter 15 says this. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. When I was in prison, inmates uh, commonly said that uh, the reason they were in prison is they hung around the wrong crowd. So they'd stand up in, in, in the service and they'd say, you know, I'm here because uh, mama told me not to come, mama told me not to come, but uh, I, I went with the wrong crowd and that's why I'm here. That's what they'd say in chapel. They'd go back to their unit and they would say, I was the big dog. I was the one that led the whole thing. I'm the chief, I'm the boss, I, I, I did it all. It all changed. And so we have this, this idea that silly putty reveals what is around us. So bad company corrupts good morals. Silly putty is just a reflection of what everyone is doing. And now we are doing it. Inmate came to me one day and wanted uh, to talk with me. And, and now most inmates come to my, uh, would come to my office and they would make some small talk. They would say how great of a preacher I was. I knew it was a setup. What they were after was, 
can I use your phone? I said all these really nice things to you, so buttered you up. Now can I use your, your phone? Uh, my minutes are out. I, I need, I need uh, uh, to use your phone. But this guy, that was different. He came to me, and he didn't ask to use the phone. He really wanted to talk with me. I love those times. And so they said, Chaplain, I don't know what it's like to be me. I have fooled so many people that I don't even know who I am. I don't know how to con do a conversation without getting something from them. And so immediately I said to him, how do I know you're not conning me right now? Do you know what con man means? Reuben, do you know what a con man means? What is it? That's pretty weak. That's how you talk with your mom and dad? Give me a voice that uh, is more like mom and dad. Someone who, mom, help him out. Okay, a con man is short for confidence. So Herman Melville wrote a book uh, called Confidence Man, and he went around the went around the ship, and every conversation he had, he changed his personality to fit the situation. There are, there are um, personality disorders that, that have that problem. They really don't know what's at the core, who they really are, because they've been living off other people all their life. So we have what's called silly putty that has handed over its original identity to have whatever is around them and sticks to it and it reflects the same image. In 1997, Josh Harris wrote a very popular book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Have you ever heard of that book? It became very popular. Three years ago, he walked away from his mega church. He divorced his wife. And he said as clear as he could, I am not a Christian. In the biblical sense, I have fallen away. And now he is involved with the homosexual lifestyle and is the master of parades and has given it all up. Now, don't let the world mold you into its fashion. He allowed the culture to change his views. Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord speaks to the, you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations, and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens. 
Although the nations are terrified by them, the customs of the people are delusion. So Josh Harris has said, I want delusion. The customs of the world, that's what I want to be known by. Ephesians 6 talks about the schema, verse 11. Put on the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Josh Harris chose to follow the schemes of the devil. He is allowing the devil to write the script. He <clears throat> has accepted the script, and now he's reading from that script, and he's becoming like the world. You have to understand, the first part of Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is a negative and so we're going to be talking about some negative things today. We will get to the positive about being transformed, but we want to look at the different kinds of molds that the world puts us in. Romans 12.2 is not only concerned with us merely making various concessions to this age or coming down I don't know how many of you had flared pants in the 70s. I had some white pants that came down and uh, it would flare out and I had some girls put some, some pretty exciting uh, material. I wish I still had them. I would not be able to fit into them, but he had hair down where I could reach behind, if you can believe that, reach behind and, and touch my hair. I, I, was, uh, I was cool. That's all there is to it. I was a cool guy. The fads of the world, they change all the time. And so we change with them. It, we think back 10 years ago and, and how we had to find places with a map. Kids, a map is paper. And tried to find the directions and it was always tough to refold the map and all the rest. And now we just simply have a smartphone that is smarter than I am. I can't figure it out many times. And so fads of the day, we change uh, uh, along the way. And, and what we thought was cool, kids, cool means rad all right if that helps fads of the day the amish have no electricity in their homes kerosene lamps are what they use once the sun goes down their plowing is done by horses and a man uh, following behind as it plows the ground. They ride these um, interesting bikes that uh, they, they, they scoot with one uh, foot and larger wheels and they they have handles and they, they go on down the road. It's quite amazing. They ride a lot of bikes. But the big thing is buggies. They have these buggies. And we lived in Ohio and we, we saw a lot of the buggies. And the sad thing is that many of the horse and buggies were, were hit by cars and 
Every year there was somebody that was killed by it. Their motto, why they do what they do is, is based on what we're looking at today. Do not be conformed to this world. And so they have said, we will not be conformed, even though everyone is going at, a, at a, a, a very fast pace, we will stay the way we are. We won't be conformed to this world. Now what's interesting is they have restaurants, and the restaurants have electricity, and we love their food. I mean, they had great food, and they had markets, and they, they had all that. But when they went home, all of a sudden they had no electricity. And I don't know why, but they were in an area looking through DVDs. And I thought, how are you going to watch them? Why are you getting DVDs? And so we learned a lot by watching them, but they were stuck in an era that they said was not being conformed to this world. John Weaver grew up Amish. He said that he was... Uh, he had uh, grown up, he heard first eight words of this verse that the Amish gathered and used as their text many times. Do not be conformed to this world. But Weaver pointed out that the phrase is only the beginning of the sentence, not the end. There is a comma it is not a period and about not being conformed. John tells us an event. He remembered that he took place 50 years ago. I was in a store when a curious customer asked the Amish worker why the Amish dress as they do. The girl, obviously uncomfortable with the question, blurted out, the Bible says that we are, we guys are not, are different from you guys. So the first part of the verse shaped an entire community. And living in Ohio, we would, we would see a lot of the Amish and enjoyed being with them. We, we had many discussions. Their buggies were very fancy. My wife and I stayed at a, a bed and breakfast. And it was interesting to hear them talk about the Amish because they were raised Amish. They are not doing the best not to conform to this world. If you, if you have to do uh, what you have to know about the Amish, you would know if you drove, drove around Ohio and, and Pennsylvania area. They do not have a car, but what's interesting is they'll hire a driver to drive them to Walmart. But they don't want to be conformed. The Amish called anyone that was not Amish English. It's much like the Jewish would say, everyone that's not Jewish is Gentile. Most religions agree there's something wrong with man. 
And so they, they try to come up with an answer of how to fix man. And we have our own version of the fall of man and brokenness that we are, that can be healed. In other words, man is one big lump of clay waiting to be molded by either the world or God. Romans 12.1 is both a challenge and the message of hope that God is in the business of taking broken pieces and making something great. Jeremiah gives us kind of a, a vision of what it's like to, to be broken and what God can do. Jeremiah 18, verse 3. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Can I not, O Israel, deal with you as the potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. Clay in the potter's hand, the idea that he can form and fashion, even though it looks terrible at first, what is this glob of clay going to look like? And so do not be conformed to this world, the schema, the fads of the day. The idea behind the word is being absorbed completely into the culture that you can't tell the difference between a Christian and those that are non-Christian. Let's look at some of the molds that we can be cast in. You know, some people are, live in the past. They're always looking back. It's like their life is over. And they're just telling you the story of what has happened long ago. That's when I was living. That's when I was doing things. But today, I'm not, I'm not really living. Let me tell you about the past. Nothing new under the sun, Solomon says. I told you my wife and I stayed at a bed and breakfast with the Amish people. And it is, it is, it was amazing hearing them talk about the Amish people. And they pointed out that the Carriages are different colors, and you can tell the sect of the Amish by the color of their carriage. And they also pointed out that they don't have any buttons on their dresses. They didn't have buttons. And so one, one girl asked her father, why, why don't we use buttons? And he said, it's tradition. I worked with a Hasidic uh, rabbi, and I asked him, um, about the various hats I would see uh, as they would walk to the synagogue. And I said, I saw these hats, like these hats here, made out of beaver, 
And he says, yeah, I have one. And I said, what does that have to do with the Bible? What, where would you look in the Bible to find wear a beaver hat to the synagogue? And he said, oh, it's tradition. Tradition! Tradition. It was tradition. Why do you do things? Habits in the past, when you're asked, why do you do it? Well, my parents used to do it. My grandparents used to do it. That's why I do it. Those beaver hats cost over $8,000. That's an expensive habit. I could go to New York and see the Yankees with that. And if you want to take an offering from me to go, yeah, <laughs> sell the hat, all right. Tradition. Jesus was in the midst of a conversation with the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7. The discussion was on what makes a person clean. And Jesus says, it is not done from the outside. but from the inside. It's not done from the outside. It's done from the inside. These are the kinds of, that only clean the outside, where you're just doing things by tradition. You're, you, you've got a script. You're just reading from it. But you didn't make that decision. Jesus said that following traditions is not what worship is all about. Worship is reasonable. Remember in verse 1, reasonable service of worship means we've thought it out ourselves. Jesus desires those who will worship him in spirit and truth. There are similar molds, but instead of tradition, uh, the mold is found where people who never come up with their own ideas they're constantly looking to others who they think are cool, and they try to um, do the same thing that they're doing. Uh, Fonzie, you remember him, don't you? You know, and so how many got their leather coat and flipped up the collar and slicked their hair back and said, hey. See, other driven, other driven. You look around, you see what others are doing and you do the same thing. You don't think for yourself I know I've done this before, but I want you to do it uh, for me again. Would you uh, stand up? See, you need to stand up. Would you stand up and point to southeast? Where is southeast? Point to it right now without thinking about it. Very, very good. Pretty good, some are back and not, all right, you can be seated. 
Here's the thing. Some of you started in one direction and then changed. Why did you change? You looked at somebody else, didn't you? Somebody that you thought was, I mean, they, they didn't hesitate. It's right out that way. Just remember, organs this way and the coast is that way and the sun comes up that way, so we're other driven. We, we, we look to someone we think knows the answer and, and then we decide, I'm going to do the same thing. Other driven. Now that might not be a bad idea if, you've, if you find a saintly person and you follow their example, they're your mentor, but it is tragic when we see someone who we think is famous and is, is happy and doing, doing the things we wish we were doing, and so we point in their direction, the direction they're pointing at. There's another group that is inner directed. That means that they have a core and they're, they're following what they think is, is the right thing no matter what. Daniel chapter three, verse one, Nebuchadnezzar. Can you spell that for me, Lydia? <laughs> Lydia, can you spell Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, as you looked at it, you had to look at a yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. That's a big one. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king, you're, you're, you read this, though. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made, made an image of God the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So a um, cubit was from your elbow to the top of your hand. Uh, so it was an approximate amount. It was a huge, huge undertaking. And and the idea was every time the, the um, music began, everybody was supposed to fall down and worship this idol. And many said that it was Nebuchadnezzar's picture. It's, it was his face. Everybody was to fall down and worship him. Those are... Those are other directed. <laughs> you were told to fall down, so I will fall down. And so there were three people that decided that that wasn't the right thing. Daniel 3, verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the providence of, of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Tebedwego. They're uh, men who, O king, have disregarded you they do not uh, serve the, your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see, they were inner directed. It didn't matter what others were doing, they were inner directed.
going against the world, going against the tide, inner directed Christians able to say no to what they know is sin. Inmates um, like to steal from food service. <laughs> the, the funniest one was my son was in um, in in prison. Not bad. He was he was working in prison as a uh, food um, food dude. He did the he, he got all the food ready for the inmates, and then and then after his workers were done they would file by him and he would have to do a, a, a search because inmates love to steal from food service. And so this, this guy was kind of walking uh, strangely. My son said, come here. Look. What do you have between your legs? And the guy pulled out a whole chicken. <laughs> a raw chicken in between his legs. He was going to take it back to his unit. He'd be the hero. Give me that thing. Other directed, I, I, I used to preach about stealing is stealing. So if, if, if you think stealing from food service is somehow all right, and you come back to chapel and sit here and sing and, and carry on that you are stealing from food service. One of my jobs as a chaplain was to go through segregation, and I went through segregation, and one of the, uh, the top inmates, I thought, uh, in chapel ended up in, in segregation, and he had black eyes, and, and I said, hey, what happened? He said, I uh, listened to your sermon. Very few people do this. I uh, listened to your sermon about stealing, and I was making $40 a day uh, having all kinds of, uh, of uh, sandwiches that I would take out of food service and sell back in the unit. And I told the guys, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And a guy beat him up because he wouldn't bring him his sandwich anymore. You see, he was interdirected. In the biblical story that in Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar became enraged and how dare these people go against what I have said you must do. I want you to take the, the strongest men and, and, and bind them and throw them into the furnace and make it seven times hotter. Seven times hotter. I want you to listen what interdirected people sound like. Daniel 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. <laughs> I tell you, these are the three role models. These are the guys that you would want in our church. 
You would want them to stand up and, and give their testimony about how they stood up to the king and said, I don't have to answer you, but I, I will answer you. And, and I'll tell you this, that God will deliver us. And even if we burn up in the fire, we still are not going to serve you. That's interdirected. Interdirected. It's holiness. Interdirected. That's what we need to be is interdirected. Well, you know the story how God came in and his, sent his son. And they, even Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, wait a minute. There's four of you walking around in there. I don't understand. I want to know your God. That's the God I want to know. I, I, I'm the false one. How many of the movie stars have said, my life is empty? How many have committed suicide? They have nothing. And yet, we put their posters up on our wall. These are the ones that we need to have up on our wall. Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. That's the guys. Those are the guys. Their faith changed the heart of the king. They were interdirected. Interdirected Christians know what is right and what is wrong. They're not confused. Interdirected Christians know about a guardrail that God has put up. Have you, have you ever noticed, have you, have you ever noticed being up on, Carly hates the, you know, the, She's a sharp person. She hates, she hates the heights. And have you ever noticed that if you go up on a rooftop and it doesn't have a guardrail, you'll, you'll stand way back here and your legs are shaking. But if it has a guardrail, you go right up to it and you hold on to that guardrail and you look down and it's all right. Except for Carolee, she's still back there. That inner directed has that guardrail in our life. Well, folks, we've only begun looking at the molds. I will come back to this inner directed part as we look at the different kinds of molds the world tries to put us in. Are you okay if I stop right here? I'm okay with it. I have to take my girlfriend on out for her her thing. So this is only part one. Silly putty. Silly putty. Stand with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Man, I love you folks. Thank you, Lord. There are some people who wish that they were here today and not in a hospital bed. We pray for them. We pray for Carolyn. She has her plate full. And we pray for those that uh, in her family are, are sorrow right now. But we know that, that Carolyn has that kind of strength, that inner strength. And we pray for our congregation. Thank you for your love for us and what you're doing in our midst. In thy precious name, amen.